Theme number one, archaeology and the environment. Archaeology and the environment. So what do I mean by that? It's really a reconstruction of, our, of uh, the environment in the ancient past. So what we're looking for is what I like to call the longest word in archaeology. I think it is paleo-environmental reconstruction. I know. Paleo-environmental reconstruction. There's a lot of letters in that. It's actually pretty straightforward. Paleo-environmental, that means old environment, and then reconstruction. You're trying to figure out what the ancient environment was like a thousand years ago. Because what I like to say is that sets the scene, right? It's the background to the diorama of life. So you need that background to understand what else is going on. And what we're really looking at, we're not just looking at, oh, was it sunny? a thousand years ago? Oh, was it seven degrees cooler a thousand years ago? Yeah, okay. But what we really want is the balance between culture, between what people do, and the environment. So it's really that mix between people and the environment. That's what matters, right? It's one thing just to list, okay, the high temperatures for the last thousand years, but what does that mean to people? And I'm sure we can all understand that the environment is absolutely important in terms of how people live their lives, right? So how do we measure this? Where do we go? There's really, there's really three, I would say, general zones where we go to reconstruct the ancient environment, things that we can do to get information that'll do that. The first place are cores. And what I mean by that is you'll sort of actually drill in and get a core sample. Those are ice cores and um, trees. You will core trees for tree rings. The ice cores, you can do this in like Greenland or you can do it in Antarctica. And it's basically where layers of ice have been laid down for really tens of thousands, I think hundreds of thousands of years in some instances. And each year, you got a little layer of ice. So you can core it, you can drill in and take out a piece. And it gives you this nice little record of weather on Earth over the last many, many thousands of years. And as an extra added bonus, inside of each of these layers of ice, you can have a little bit of air from 50,000 years ago. Hey, a little bit of 50,000 year old air. You can breathe it, you can go, oh, 50,000 year old air. But what's in there? What's that air like? What is the um, consistency of the air on planet Earth? You can also get pollen, more on that later. Pollen, worldwide phenomena, dude. Those of you allergy sufferers, sorry man. Pollen, even Antarctica, everywhere. Can't get away. So, more, more on that later. But you can get lots of stuff from these ice cores in terms of ancient weather conditions. The other thing, of course, is coring into trees. You can get tree ring data. We've already talked about tree rings in terms of dating, but trees can also give you the basic, what was the weather like out? Fat ring in a tree, it was a wet year. It's that simple, right? So that's number one in our paleo environmental reconstruction. I would say the, this coring thing of ice or of trees. Second, I would call this second instance plants and animals. What do I mean by plants and animals? Really, when you're working at an archaeological site, you can find ancient plant remains and ancient animal remains. A lot of these, um, especially the plants, we would call them ecofacts. You're going to hear that term in archaeology, ecofacts. What that means is it's something from that environment a thousand years ago that human beings didn't mess with. They didn't do anything to it. It's not an artifact. It's not like an arrowhead or something. It's something like a seed, a seed from a tree. A human being didn't do anything with that seed, but it still tells you about what it was like out outside a thousand years ago. 
right? Eco facts. So in the plants and animals world, since I'm on it, let's do plants. Uh, you can already find eco facts like seeds. Another eco fact I just talked about earlier, pollen, pollen from the various plants. The plants that were around a thousand years ago or 5,000 years ago, that's going to tell you what it was like outside, right? If you find pollen from pine needles, probably kind of cold, you know? If you find pollen from hibiscus flowers, probably kind of tropical, right? Pollen's great because actually under a microscope, you can really tell the difference. It's really obvious. I've done this. Like you, you look and a pollen grain will be instantly, you'd be like, oh, that's corn or whatever. It's very obvious at a microscopic level what pollen is goes to what plant. Um, now, how do you get it? You're at an archaeology site. You're like, oh, you just dig up some pollen. You put it in your little pollen cup. How do you, how do you get, you picture it, there's like dirt. How do you get pollen out of that? You use flotation. You're like, Kinkella, what's flotation? <laughs> flotation is you basically get a big 55 gallon drum full of water and it's kind of bubbling up because you still have water in your 55 gallon drum. It's coming in from the bottom. You take your soil, your soil sample, and you pour it in the water, right? So you pour this soil in, and of course it's sort of bubbling and all this kind of stuff, but you actually have a little bit of um, sort of fine fabric. Uh, it's called tool. Those of you who, you know, go to Joanne's Fabrics and, and sew, you know what I mean? That, that, that sort of fine chiffon stuff that's in tutus, that stuff, you put a sheet of that below. So when you pour your uh, soil sample in, the heavy stuff goes down and lays on the low sheet. Now, in your 55 gallon drum, there's a little lip where the water's constantly pouring out. You put another piece of tool right there. And so the light stuff floats to the top, hence the name flotation. And you kind of easily kind of scoop it off the top surface and into that second piece of tool. That is called your light fraction. The heavy fraction or the heavy rocks and stuff that are still in there in the 55 gallon drum. But the light stuff floats. And in that light stuff, that's going to be your organic stuff like pollen, little seeds, little bits and pieces of plant remains. That's how you divide out the soil and the rocks and stuff from the actual pollen. It's how you get the pollen out of the dirt. Then you can look in your microscope and trust me, when you do too much of this, it makes you feel kind of sick. Anybody ever done this? Like microscope for like 20 minutes, your world is just like brrrr. And you're like, oh, this pollen sample is very mm. No, I'm mm. Right, so beware when you're using the microscope to look at your pollen. Um, that's basically, that's a very quick uh, cut and dry situation on, on the plant world. And that's going to be called floral analysis. You'll see this term, floral analysis. On the other side, animals, faunal analysis. And when you're looking at animals on an archaeological site, and this is going to be like animal bones. Again, animal bones, man. It's going to tell you what kind of animals were living there 5,000 years ago. You know, oh, I found some elephant animal bonds. Maybe kind of a savanna situation. You get, you get my meaning here? Pretty straightforward. Now with animal bones, you're gonna run into terms like zooarchaeology. It's the word zoo in front of archeology. span It just means you're looking at the like animal past archeologically of the area, zooarchaeology. Um, there, uh, of the bones, in my experience, it's kind of a broken up situation, honestly. Sometimes you're lucky and you're like, oh right, that's a buffalo femur and it's real obvious. Most of the time, it's these little bits of broken up bone that's like, you're like, mammal, I guess. So what can you do? You got a ton of broken up bones. How can you make sense out of this? MNI, minimum number of individuals. Minimum number of individuals, MNI. What that means. You have a big pile of bone that you found from your site. Most of it is just trashy junk, but what can you get some real information out of this? Yes, you can. So you could just count up the bones, but who cares? Oh, I have 
4,259 deer bones. Oh, I mean 4,200 and crack 60 deer bones. That, it, that's not really a worthwhile number. An MNI number is minimum number of individuals means it is the minimum number of animals you had to kill to get the bones that you have. Now, let's use our deer example. Let's say I have two deer skulls, four deer pelvises, and eight right rear leg bones. So two, four, and eight right rear leg bones. What is the minimum number of individuals I had to kill? Minimum number of deer I had to kill to get the pile of bones in front of me. It's eight. I had to kill at least eight because I have eight right rear leg bones, right? So I had to kill at least eight. Uh, in reality, there's probably more there. Those two skulls and four pelvises, those are probably from completely different deer. Right? So there's probably like 12 or 10 there or something like that. But I know I have eight. And that's a real number. Now, if you do that with the other creatures at your site, then you can start to get real numbers and be like, oh, there's actually not that many deer here after all. You know, you might have these broken up bits, but I can only say for sure that there's eight. Th that's what you want to do with your animal bones. You want to do these... Um, analyses, I guess you could say, where you get real numbers. You're not just measuring them and weighing them or something. You know, that doesn't get you that much. But MNI is nice. So, we've had our little plant world, we've had our little animal world, what's left? Really, there's one more area that I like to look in if I'm reconstructing the environment, right? And that is actually what people left behind. Their material culture, their artifacts. The artifacts themselves can tell you what the world was like outside 5,000 years ago. If you find a bunch of whale harpoons, there were whales around, you know? And I know, I wish it was, I wish it was easier. I wish I could say, well, if you just find their winter clothing, it was cold outside. But as we know, most clothes or this kind of thing, it, they're not going to last. So you got to go with the little bits and pieces of artifacts, often with hunting. You know, what kind of animals were these used for for hunting? Oh, that tells you what it was like outside because those animals had to exist in this kind of area. My favorite, my favorite material culture bits of the past that, that tell us about uh, the environment is rock art. That's the best. Sometimes rock art is very symbolic and kind of hard to know what's going on. Other times, hey man, if they drew a deer, there were deer there. You know? Oh, it's so nice. If you're working in an area and they drew it, they had it. They didn't conjure deer out of a dream. They're like, dude, I'm going to draw this because there's one right over there, right? So rock art can be a really great hint in terms of what the environment was like a thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, right? So in the end, when we're dealing with archaeology of the environment, we have these three general ways. We have these core samples that we can take. We have kind of the plants and animal stuff we find at our site. And finally, we have the actual material culture artifacts and the rock art, right? And we bring this all together. And then ultimately we set up the background diorama of the play that we're gonna explain later.